Yeah. You're all set. So I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today. A man who really needs no introduction. Uh, my colleague twice over, Paul Petrosky, who's a um, distinguished professor of philosophy and cognitive science. And he'll be his talk today is Means as Composable Scores. Thanks. So uh, since this is uh, an in-house uh, thing, I thought I would just uh, give you a sense of some things I do, and then uh, people want to uh, talk. Uh, we can talk uh, over coming years. So I want to start with a picture of the human infant as seen by a linguist, um, right? Uh, it's a language acquisition um, device. Uh, and everybody's seen this picture uh, before, I'm sure, many times. Um, and uh, you, the kid gets themselves, herself into a state where they connect pronunciations with meanings. Uh, maybe in a language like Japanese, maybe a couple of uh, languages. Um, what I want to just focus on is what I've been um, thinking about for an unduly long period of time, is what are the meanings that we connect uh, with the pronunciations? In particular, what are word meanings and what are sentence meanings? Um, are word meanings mental representations of some kind or are they aspects of a shared um, environment? So you got a word like blue, uh, and there might be something blue out there and some kind of mental representation. A blue, you got a sentence, the blue one came, came up six. Do we think of meanings as themselves exhibiting a kind of syntactic structure of the sort you might learn about in your syntax class or some underlying syntactic structure of the language of thought of the so that Jerry Fodor or William Lockham might have wanted to um, talk about? Uh, or should we think about sentence meanings as sets of possible situations? So if I got these two dice out there uh, and they're fair-sided dice, I can think that there are 36 possible states of the dice. And to say the blue one came up six might be to say it's one of those um, six possibilities um, at the bottom. Um, uh, here's a very brief, very brief and biased history of, the, of this. There's what I think of as the age of reason, which went from Aristotle to the beginning of the 20th century, where you're thinking, somebody thinks, of course, French is really the language of thought, as we were told. Um, uh, um, uh, and you've got some concept in the language of thought that's about dogs, and it applies to some things out there. And you might say the word dogs, but the word dogs gets its meaning by relation to a mental representation, and that mental representation is what connects out to the world. Then after the age of the reason, there was the dark ages um, of the uh, uh, early part of the 20th century, where you just like say, I don't know, uh, uh, there's no meanings, nothing going on uh, in the head. Um, and then, uh, right, the resurgence of uh, cognition in the 50s, where you're back, basically, as far as I can tell, to the classical picture with the idea that the sentence, uh, spoken sentence has a certain bit of syntactic structure. And then there is, between 1967 and 1965, what I think of as the externalist and extensionalist counter-reformation, where um, you trade in the idea that um, uh, it's the mind that makes the direct contact with the world. But thinking, no, the word dog, the word dog itself latches out there to the dogs. And maybe the word concept somehow comes along um, for the ride. And if you've got two different people um, in their own particular languages of thoughts, thinking about things, they're coordinating on both the word dog and the dogs out there. Um, and um, if you start reading, you know, so there's Donald Davidson, um, David Lewis, Richard Montague, and then just a pile of stuff. And you pick up any standard semantics textbook um, these days, and it is part of the externalist and extensionalist counter-reformation. The meanings are out there uh, in the world somehow. They're things we um, coordinate on. And um, meanings of sentences are, to a first approximation, something like sets of possible situations. And basically, I've been had a career which basically saying we'd be much better off going um, back to 1967 and starting over again. Um, and uh, what I want to suggest is you know, give you some snapshots about why I think that's really the way forward in semantics. Go back to 1967 um, and start over again, um, where your picture would be individuals um, uh, uh, thinking and talking, but um, uh, really the classical age of reason picture. So what I want to do is start with one of my favorite passages, um, actually, in linguistics. This is 1968, Chomsky and Halley on the sound pattern of English, where they tell us, uh, this is at the highlight of the, uh, what I think of as the, uh, the, the, the cognitive uh, resurgence, right before Lewis and uh, Montague and company have gone to work. Um, the goal of the descriptive study of language is the construction of a grammar. 
Um, and uh, a language, think of it as set sentences you like, but every sentence pairs an ideal phonetic form with an intrinsic semantic interpretation. That vocabulary sounds so weird now to the modern semantics. You, wait, a sentence has an intrinsic semantic representation, um, and that really is the way you know, people, were, people were talking uh, in the 60s. Um, and uh, uh, then you draw a competence performance distinction and say that um, uh, speakers uh, have a knowledge of the grammar, knowledge of this intrinsic connection, of sound and meaning. So back to our picture of the baby from the linguist's um, point of view. You think of the child as acquiring this um, language, the, human, the state of the human language faculty that got Englished by some course of experience. And that faculty in its English state pairs pronunciations with meanings. And you think of pronunciations and meanings as like head internal things. They're not out there uh, in the world. Um, acoustic signals are out there uh, in the world, and they are, so to speak, causally downstream of the pronunciations. And there are external things out there you talk about that causally affect you, but they are, so to speak, um, causally upstream uh, or downstream in the meanings, depending on, on which way it thinks. That's why I th think of uh, Chomsky and Halley, it was the picture um, they were operating with. Uh, and so you can think of the state the child achieves as this implementation of a grammar that generates expressions, every one of which connects its own intrinsic meaning with its pronunciation. In the initial state, it's this meta procedure. Um, it's a, a procedure, call it universal grammar if you like, that lets the child under the pressure of growth and experience acquire one of these more um, specific ones. Um, go ahead and call the acoustic signals if we're talking about a spoken language or the mo motions of arms and hands if we're talking about a sign language. You can call them pronunciations too if you like. Likewise, you can think about the things out there in the world, meanings to, if you like, and if you prefer to call the pronunciations PFs, phonological forms, and the meanings LFs or, uh, for a logic form, that's all fine. The terminology isn't what really what matters to me. What I, want, what I, I think it's useful to do is just have that chomsky Halley picture of what the language system is doing you know, back on the table again, because it really, it really just has gotten lost, um, I think where you would think of the uh, a grammar as something like a mint that's generating two-sided coins. Um, and uh, you might think of one side of the coin is, a, is uh, something that gets read or interfaces with perceptual articulatory systems, and the other side of the coin interfaces with contextual and intentional systems, so you've got different readers of these things. But the mint is cranking out things that really do have heads and tails, and uh, the heads and tails are aspects of the coins being generated by the mint, not things out there. Uh, in the environment. Um, uh, and another analogy I kind of like is um, uh, uh, musical scores, where uh, this is a sort of thing from Bach with figured bass at the bottom, uh, right? And so uh, and you might, and then might have it written out in a different way uh, in the treble clef. But you could imagine a machine that's cranking out complex scores, where, so to speak, the bass line gets read in its way by one reader, and the soprano line is getting read by, uh, uh, in another way by its reader. Or actually, the uh, analogy I really like, um, which is um, uh, blueprints. Um, if you imagine a composer that's um, creating what you might think of as choreographed blueprints for building up concepts. Um, so actual blueprints, not for building up churches, but for building up mental representations. And they're not blueprints with lines. They're actually choreographic scores. Um, so you're actually imagine something like danceable blueprints for building concepts. That, I think, is the picture that Chomsky and Halley had. Um, you know, I've been trying to articulate it myself, but on my reading what was going on in 1967-68, that is the picture that they were um, uh, operating with. And so what I want to do is, although I'm certainly not a phonologist, but um, uh, uh, just go back and remind um, uh, people of some things that um, Halley said. This is from, happens to be from a 1990 um, paper, but he had the same view, I think, sorry, they held for all of his career. Um, you think of vocal pronunciation as involving this, as uh, Morris used to put it, gymnastics of these uh, various anatomical structures. So you're changing the geometry of the vocal tract. Um, and uh, this is the last paragraph. If utterances are regarded as dances performed by multiple portions of the tract, then Morris concluded, um, underlying every utterance, uh, there's a score in some choreographic notation that instructs the dancers on um, what to do uh, and when. Um, and so if you're not familiar with it, there are, of course, choreographic uh, instructions of various um, kinds um, these days. Uh, and if you think of um, uh, pronunciations as a kind of scores, then you might, then of course, that don't have to be limited to vocal or uh, audible um, scores. 
And we know that with regard to vocalizations, um, uh, even if we're talking about now a spoken language, not a signed one, obviously sopranos and baritones differ. For an individual, the same word, saying the same word on different occasions could produce um, different waveforms. Uh, the word size pronunciation ain't going to be just a string of phonemes. The sound waves we know don't determine where the word boundaries are. Intentions matter uh, a lot. Um, uh, 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 there's the McGurk effect. And since we got a couple visitors from philosophy, I just want to like remind us we get ourselves um, in the mood um, uh, for ba, ba, the McGurk effect. Ba, 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 <clears throat> ba, 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 ba. Ba 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 ba. So, um, the reason I want to just start with pronunciation is that um, even though the truth is out there, um, it's become pretty commonplace that the pronunciation themselves may not be right. Um, uh, uh, you can think of the pronunciation as really complicated interaction effect between a mind, a vocal tract, um, and what's going on uh, uh, in the acoustic stream. Um, but if you wanted to focus on what is the language faculty pairing with meaning, so what it's, when the child gets to acquire English, and you ask, it's in this state of a knowing English, there are these things you might want to call pronunciations that it's pairing with meanings. Then you'd be saying, well, look, um, uh, if you're following uh, Hallie and lots of other uh, people, you might think that the pronunciations are more like internal scores that are getting used to um, generate, for example, um, sound waves, and that the pronunciations are much more like the internal scores, uh, the choreographic score that the dancers are following, than, um, than any um, um, uh, external um, physical stimulus. So if we're used to the thought, well, actually, investigation can reveal that um, the things that grammar pairs with meanings are not out there so much. Uh, as some kind of things in a representational um, format that are being connected by a grammar to meanings, they may say, well, maybe it's the other way around is, is just as true, that the meanings the grammar is pairing with pronunciations are not things um, uh, out there, but rather things that are uh, on the relevance on the semantic side, the relevant analog of scores. And if you recall the lessons from 1957 to 1967 with regard to syntax, it's not that surprising in fact, that um, while the truth is out there, um, the pronunciations might not be, um, you might think that the, um, uh, the syntactic structure is even less likely to be uh, out there. And so what I want to do is now just remind you of this, because I want to say is that in some sense it would have been amazing if meanings turned out to be out there. Um, if the pronunciations turn out not to be in the syntaxes, and meanings would have been the oddball out. And then I'm going to shift to saying, and there's no reason to think meanings um, are the oddball um, out in this regard. So just by way of recalling right, some uh, morals that we were taught, uh, or some of us I think, felt we were taught between uh, uh, 57 and uh, 67, um, uh, every human grammar generates endlessly many expressions, but not, for example, in the way that a finite uh, automaton would generate um, uh, endlessly many strings. So there's the famous machine that will generate any, random stri any number of A's you like followed by um, any uh, number of B's. Uh, and now here's a different kind of uh, grammar uh, a kind of rewrite uh, system of rewrite rules that will generate all and only the same strings. You start with a start symbol S that you get to rewrite. Let's say as some, there's going to be something on the left, something on the right, and you target the thing that's going to uh, that, that capital L and rewrite it as you're allowed to. You get to rewrite L as AL, and now you target that L and rewrite it as AL, and you do it again. And now you start targeting that thing on the right and rewrite it, and target the thing on the right and rewrite it, and you get yourself a string of A's followed by um, a string of B's. As Chomsky pointed out, the very same derivation you can do one way, you could have done another way. So let's start by targeting that R and rewrite it as BR and rewrite again. And now do the rewriting on rewrite the L as AL, rewrite, rewrite and you get to the same place by a slightly different derivational path using exactly the same number of rewrite rules exactly the same number of times. 
And so Chomsky said, that's cool for two reasons. Um, one, it lets you characterize a notion of equivalent derivations, where you're using the same number of uh, rewrite rules the same number of times. But far more importantly, said, that allows you to define a notion of constituency structure, which we know and love and represent with these trees. These um, trees that linguists like to write are nothing more or less than um, summaries of equivalence classes of derivations. Um, and so the really interesting thing about the rewrite systems from Chomsky's point of view was that um, they allowed you to make sense of a notion of constituency. So the tree represents, for example, those three occurrences of the letter A as a constituent, all descending from the capital L, um, and that likewise um, for the uh, little b's, whereas the finite state system, although it generates the same strings, doesn't impose any constituency structure uh, on those strings, right? Neither the AAA nor the BB has any status that the AB in the middle doesn't have so far as the finite state system is concerned, but generate the same strings by the um, rewrite rules, and you get to say, yeah, there's a real notion of constituency structure there, but of course the notion of constituency structure ain't in the strings, it's being imposed by the grammar that's generating the strings. As Chomsky stressed again and again, constituency structure reflects derivational structure. And for those of you that know what kind of memory that corresponds to, insert your um, uh, uh, computer science 101 class um, here. Um, so uh, uh, constituency certainly isn't out there. Um, uh, constituency structure is a property of the string we talk about uh, but if we're talking about the property of the string as generated by a certain uh, computate kind of computational procedure. And as then Chomsky went on to stress in syntactic structures, it's not as though the grammars the kid acquires are these simple rewrite systems. In fact, these grammars also allow for transformations that crucially rely on constituency structure. Right, so, uh, right, remember the argument for transformations went, um, uh, uh, sorry, the argument for constituency structure went, look, to get anything even remotely in the right ballpark, you're going to need transformations, and in fact, transformations on um, constituents. So the famous case was this mess, which is the English um, auxiliary system. You knew all this stuff like she eats, she has eating, she, had, she is eating, she has been eating, she will have been eating, like who orders? all of this with the B's and the haves and the ING's um, everywhere. And Chauncey said, well, I'll tell you who orders it. It's a, it's a rewrite system that says, we're going to let you rewrite S as NPVP. You can rewrite the VP as an auxiliary followed by a verb. Let's keep the, this model really simple. You got one verb, eat. And then there came a fancy rule about what you get to do with auxiliaries. And there's going to be a tense. And then maybe a modal expression, have with its friend EN, be with its friend uh, ing, and then maybe you have some uh, tenses and some possible modal expressions and some possible NPs, and you got walked through little exercises like this, where you could rewrite and the VP as aux V, rewrite that as just aux eat, maybe just add yourself a past tense for the super simple case, she passed eat, now one little transformation rule, bounce that past tense uh, over to the verb eat, and pronounce the thing she ate. For a slightly more complicated case, how about tense plus have plus its en friend plus e, and we'll make it uh, the not past tense, the present tense for English. And although you don't pronounce it, she not past have and eat. Um, do that little rule that says take all those stupid affixes and hop them off um, to the right, and you get to pronounce it as she have plus not past eaten, she has uh, eaten. And for the truly um, nightmare case, it went the same kind of way, you got she will have been eating by saying what the system is doing is um, cranking out via some uh, a rewriting system a certain kind of string and then moving some and then uh, moving a few elements around. Right? What I want to do um, is, uh, is not worry about um, uh, uh, Chomsky's original case, but get to something that's much closer um, to meaning but you know, uh, arising from uh, uh, dissertations like Hadge Ross, and this is 1964, essays um, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 in linguistic theory. If you just give, um, and I uh, sort of really enjoy doing this with undergraduates who've never seen this before, I'll, you just give them some words, hiker lost, kept walking circles, and then some functional vocabulary, make a sentence. And the expected sentence is gonna be something like the hiker who lost, kept walking in circles, there's a surprising sentence you could make, um, though nobody does make it in class unless they've taken the class before, 
which is the hiker who lost was kept walking um, in circles, right? So there's this hiker, uh, and he lost something, and his punishment was um, forced to keep walking in circles. Um, and right snap with the auxiliary verb at the front, and you get this yes or no question, was the hiker who lost kept walking in circles? And right, uh, the familiar point was that that question is unambiguous and surprising. It's got to be the yes-no question corresponding to the hiker who lost the context was kept walking um, in circles, right? Uh, and so uh, uh, that kind of fact that a string of words fails to have a certain meaning, right, can be there even if you um, really crank up, uh, not just so that the context is surprising, but so that the available meaning is in a certain sense incoherent. So let's do guest, fed, waffles, fed, parking meter. Sensible kind of declarative, a guest who was fed waffles fed the parking meter. Crazy, but still comprehensible sense, it's not gibberish, is a guest who fed waffles was fed the parking meter, though not a sentence any ordinary human being is going to come up with given those words. But now, this is the Hadge Ross point, take um, uh, the, the, the yes no question, was a guest who fed waffles fed the parking meter? And it can only have the insane interpretation, right? Your mind just will not let you um, assign to that string of words the yes no question corresponding to the sensible question. The question is unambiguously crazy. It's a guest who fed waffles was fed the parking meter? That is, the argument was constraints on transformations. You're thinking about getting the yes-no question by moving was to the front. Will trump any independent notion of coherence. So there are constraints on transformations. So there are transformations. So there. Um, uh, try to uh, get any uh, uh, account of these facts that doesn't posit transformations. Because the thought was you can have, as long as you've got a rewriting system that's imposing structure on the string, you can have both the guest who was fed waffles, complex subject, fed the parking meter, or the guest who fed waffles, even though you can't feed waffles, it's a possible subject, was fed the parking meter, and then the idea was there's a constraint um, on yanking the auxiliary verb out of a relative clause. You're just not allowed to do that um, for whatever grammatical reasons, whereas yanking the auxiliary verb out of the matrix clause is just fine. And so, a pretty nifty explanation for why the string was the guest who fed waffles, fed the parking meter, has only one interpretation, and it's the one that's completely crazy um, uh, from uh, any independent um, point of view. That difference between being stuck in a relative clause and the main, credit, main um, uh, predicate matters for grammar and meaning, but not for conceptual coherence, and certainly not for any set of possibilities in the real, uh, real world. So, some years ago, um, uh, 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 Bob Berwick and one of his graduate students uh, and I teamed up with Chomsky to go back and ask. So, like, there's been a lot of advances in learning theory and people making all sorts of claims about what their models can learn. Um, right, those are what arguments for 57. Had anybody come up with any reply to them at all? Um, and I think the answer is just no. That in fact, the old arguments were uh, uh, about as good uh, uh, in, uh, 19, in 2011 as they were. Uh, a while before, and then lots of others um, from uh, various branches of, of linguistics and psycholinguistics have been offered. Right, take it to be now just like almost uh, something you can take for uh, granted, at least uh, probably in circles around here, that human grammars really do impose constituency uh, on strings. So there's plenty of truth, um, but um, the constituency isn't out there. And in fact, maybe pronunciations are more like scores um, so that you, um, you get the pronunciation was the guest who fed waffles fed the parking meter by um, reading that um, uh, uh, structure uh, in a way that your uh, vocal track dancers um, can handle. I think we should have to ask some questions about what meanings are all in that light. That um, sort of you look at the look at what really seems to matter to the human language system. It seems to be as matter what matters is cranking out the strings in a constituency imposing way that makes them pronounceable. And the constituency ain't out there. The pronunciations um, ain't out there. Um, so now you think, okay, our meaning is the oddball out. Our meaning is just one more um, uh, 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 aspect of uh, language. Are they? Uh, mental representations of some uh, kind that the language faculty knows how to pair with, with uh, uh, pronunciations? Or in the case of meaning, do we pop outside the head and say, no, 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 the meanings are these things out there that we're actually talking about and communicating uh, 
about. And so we can ask that question both at the level of um, sentence meaning or syntactic structure um, or uh, uh, at word level meaning. So um, uh, there's a certain sense in which you know, lots of my colleagues in semantics say sentence meanings are sets of possible situations. It's what they say in their textbooks. It's what they say at the conferences. It's what they say in the right. I can't believe they really believe it. They're too smart. But they keep saying it. Um, and so I just want to like say, look, here's why I just can't believe it for a second. Um, colorless green ideas sleep furiously, I assume, is possible in no possible situation. It just not, it's the null set of possible situations. But ditto for colorless red ideas sleep peacefully. That was, I thought, part of one of Chomsky's point in giving these examples. They're perfectly grammatical sentences. The grammar imposes structure on the string. You get a kind of interpretation that you recognize as, nope, the world can't be like that. And there seem to be lots of them. Uh, and they're all equivalent in being not, um, not true in any possible situation. Likewise, the colorless ground red hubs often ride unicorns to Hesperus. Hesperus, remember, is the evening star. Um, uh, look, there aren't any unicorns, and I assume there aren't any centaurs either. And I don't, look, David Lewis, I think, believes there are possible worlds where there are unicorns running around with centaurs. I, like, I can't get myself to believe there are such places. Um, as far as I can tell, unicorns are impossible creatures, and so are centaurs. Um, and uh, I, what with Hesperus being phosphorus and all, it, it's the planet Venus, which is identical to itself. I can't believe there's any possible world where Venus isn't identical um, to itself. That's what I thought I learned from Saul Kripke. Um, uh, groundhogs turn out to be woodchucks. They're just different names for the same, um, the same critters. And so um, you can, uh, if there's no possible worlds where colorless red groundhogs often ride unicorns to Hesperus, there aren't any where colorless green woodchucks often ride centaurs to phosphorus. And often and sometimes is just uh, not making any big uh, difference here. And colorless versus my. So it just seems you could just have endlessly many sentences that are going to be true in no possible um, uh, situations. Um, even if you just go to the toy model that people really love for thinking about meanings of sets of possible situations, we've got our two dice with 36 possibilities. Now let's just build ourselves a little re toy rewrite language. So you can say things like, uh, we'll have noun phrases like blue, the red, and the dice came up, and they'll be like the thing the dice could come up. Let's keep it really, really simple. There's only two numbers, zero and one. Um, but you get to recurse. And so you'll get to do things like blue came up followed by a number term. And your number term might be zero, one, two, three, four, so on. And so, right, we can represent that um, blue, Mr. Blue came up um, six. But of course, you can also represent that Mr. Red came up seven. That is, once you've got the engine that's letting you build up expressions combinatorially, um, you can build up the sentence red came up seven, even though it's a six-sided die. That just seems um, obvious. Likewise, you can build up the sentence blue came up, um, uh, blue came up six, and red came up seven, and so the dice came up 13. There isn't any possible situation, I take it, in the world where the dice came up 13. It's two six-sided dice. But the grammar doesn't care about that. Obviously, the grammar just gen keeps generating um, keeps generating sentences. You can have the blue came up zero and red came up 15. That's sort of like colorless green ideas sleep furiously. It's not in the cards or in the dice as far as the world is concerned. The grammar doesn't know anything about that. The grammar just keeps cranking out what it cranks out. Just seems it's just an utterly obvious point that although you have a grammar that's generating endlessly many sentences, in this toy model, you have exactly 36 possibilities. So of course, the grammar is going to um, outstrip um, the possibilities. But it's more interesting than that, because like one of the things semanticists really are supposed to care about is ambiguity. Um, and in fact, our best accounts of ambiguity just cross-cut um, anything we would say about meanings being sets of possible situations. So you can have the expression, I chased a unicorn from Mars to Venus, and that's ambiguous as between the reading according to which the unicorn is from Mars, and the chase was to end it at Venus, and we didn't say where the chase started. Or the other structure, I chased a unicorn from Mars to Venus, where I'm saying the chase started at Mars, it ended in Venus, and I have no idea where the unicorn is from. Right? Such a garden variety structural uh, ambiguity. But, um, uh, those two, oops, those two sentences, we chased a unicorn from Mars to Venus, or we chased a unicorn from Mars to Venus, 
They're as different as sentences could be with regard to saying what their meanings are, but they're true in exactly the same set of possible situations, namely none of them. Um, so unsurprisingly, your account of ambiguity is going to follow the structural distinctions. It's not following um, what's going on uh, in the world. This is also true with uh, 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 cases like some dog chased every cat, which we hear is ambiguous as between um, uh, uh, there's a particular dog that did a lot of chasing, uh, and then every cat got chased by uh, a dog, and you know, maybe um, uh, some other stuff's going on as well. So a standard kind of solution, one way or another, is to say at some level of analysis that first reading corresponds to there is a dog, such that for every cat, that dog chased the cat, versus other way around, for every cat, there is a dog um, who did the chasing. You know, maybe there's lots of dogs chasing a cat. Um, Here's the only point I want to make about this. Let me skip it. Let me that no cat for just uh, right. Uh, oop. Right. Take some odd number precedes every prime number. It's ambiguous in exactly the same way. Either some odd number is such that every prime number is that the odd one precedes the prime, which is true. There is an odd number, namely one, that precedes every prime number. I'm assuming two is the first um, uh, prime number. Um, it's also true that for every prime number, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, some odd number precedes it. Um, so you've got exactly the same kind of structural ambiguity you have with the dogs and the cats, but whatever is going on with numbers, you're not going to have possible worlds distinguishing these cases. All the distinction is, ju is just there in the um, grammatical uh, structure. So if you have some odd number precedes every prime number, it's got two distinct readings, and those two readings are true in every possible situation. Likewise, we chase the unicorn from Mars to Venus has two distinct readings, both of which are true in no possible situation. Or again, it seems like a kind of obvious point that um, uh, the uh, explanation of structural ambiguity has to do with structure, not um, uh, anything to do with sets of possible situations. And I know my colleagues know this. Um, and yet, and yet it persists. Um, that the meaning of a sentence is a set of possible situations, and that these are somehow cases that the, I don't know, like um, set aside or there's something special uh, going on. Um, and anyway, what I want to do is um, now for the rest of the talk um, is um, focus on the case of word meanings and ask, okay, let's suppose we're in for the possibility that there is some important aspect that the world is really mattering for meaning. It's not at the sentence level, yeah, you're really going to have to have grammatical structure there. It's not over where the pronunciations are. It's certainly not in the constituency structure, but it's down there once you finally get down to particular word meanings. Right? And blue would be a bad case to push on, because the idea that there's mind-independent blue out there is not going to really um, serve the needs of the externalist counter-reformation. Uh, so what I want to do is consider what I think of would have to be like a parade case of word meaning for the externalist counterformation. And then I'm going to shift and do, talk about some experimental work I've been doing with uh, us and colleagues for a long time to say, and actually, even what should be the parade case of word meaning, it's actually representational um, all the way down. Um, so uh, here's what I think of the parade case would be a word like most. And I'll say why I think that would be a, a parade case. Um, so word most appearing in sentences like most of the dots are blue. Uh, and here's going to be the thought that if even the meanings of quantifiers, of quantifiers turn out to be representationally specific, that's really bad news for the readings that meanings are not representationally specific, right? That is, logical relations are supposed to be like, look, that's just like stuff that's out there in the mind independent world. And yeah, maybe particular speakers will uh, represent these relations in one way or another. But um, quantifiers are supposed to be the holy of holies also for semantics. That's supposed to be where um, uh, the theory really has its uh, uh, primary um, bite. And it's where every single semantic textbook specifies the meanings of the quantifiers in mind independent terms as certain um, uh, extensions, typically uh, uh, pairs of uh, sets. So take a sentence like um, uh, interrogative sentence, or most of the dots yellow, which I suppose you can immediately see is true. Uh, in this case. So here's a question we can ask. How does that yes-no question get understood by competent speakers of a language? Is there some one way they understand it or do the speakers 
vary, and for any particular speaker, what question is getting asked. So in this case, there are 15 dots, nine of them yellow, six blue. And every standard semantics class will walk you through various possible ways of specifying the extension of the word most. Um, one way to think of it is roughly as meaning more than half. So that most of the dots are yellow says the number of yellow dots is bigger than the number of dots over two. Or you might say it's the number of yellow dots is bigger than the number of um, dots that are not yellow. So the yellow dots outnumber the not yellow ones. Or this one's a little more complicated, doesn't involve negation, involves subtraction. Take the number of yellow dots and say that's bigger than, now wait, the number of dots total minus the number of yellow dots. And of course, all of these have to give the same answer. If 9 is bigger than 15 plus 15 over 2, then 9 is bigger than 6, and 9 is bigger than 15 minus 9. And there's another option um, to consider it that doesn't involve number at all. So um, uh, Hume's principle says if you got some things, and you got some things, and they correspond one to one, you got the same number um, both times. So uh, you can know that the triangles are equinumerous with the heart, same number, without knowing which number that is, um, so to speak. And likewise, you could define a notion of uh, almost one-to-one -one correspondence, but maybe with some leftover. Um, and so you could define a notion one-to-one -one plus that would hold between the triangles and the hearts. It'd be to say the hearts are a proper subset of the triangles, and there's at least one left over. Um, and if you're worried about infinite cases, add the qualification and not the other way around. If you're not worried about infinite cases, good for you. Neither do kids worry about um, <laughs> infinite cases. Um, here's just the point that there are various ways a theorist could specify the truth condition most of the dots are yellow uh, with at least four possibilities about how you might think about what's going on with most. It's one-to-one -one correspondence with remainder no essentially numeric representation, or something like numeric representations involving either half or uh, uh, predicate negation or a cardinality subtraction. And so this is why I think this should be a parade case for the externalist extensional um, counter-reformation, because here's a case where you might think, look, one person really might well think of the most relation in terms of one-to-one -one correspondence with leftovers. Somebody else might do it in terms of, let's say, uh, number representation and negation, and somebody else might do it without the negation and the subtraction. And in particular, you might think like little kids who can't count would be doing it one way, and adults who are full counters might be doing it um, uh, another way. Um, so um, uh, 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 our group, which involved um, Justin Halberta at uh, uh, Johns Hopkins, Jeff Lids um, at the University of Maryland, and a raft of graduate students that I'll show you a picture of at the end, we originally got interested in this because we were just interested in think, seeing um, uh, do quantifier representations, we have a proportional quantifier like most, do they involve um, uh, cardinality representations at some level or not? I had placed a large bet on not since I was the village philosophical logician and Justin, the village um, psychologist, says um, that involves negation. Rats don't like negation. I'm betting uh, on the one that doesn't have negation and I had to pay up. Um, that bet in the end. But we originally were interested in just trying to figure out, do people understand quantifiers in terms of number representations? I then got independently interested in this as a way of thinking about, hmm, if, if, the, if the meaning of most is representationally specific, that's like bad news for my colleagues who are thinking that meanings are not representationally um, specific. These are all, um, they're provably equivalent for finite cases, and none of them are crazy. So for example, Karen Wynn and lots of other people have worked showing that babies can do one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, uh, various kinds of numeral uh, representations we know are available to uh, they, uh, infants and other animals given approximating um, systems. Uh, Martin Hockel uh, and his group has done some stuff on thinking about um, uh, notions like more than half. Um, uh, what I'm just going to do is, since this is an in-house talk, I'm not going to walk through the experiments in detail. I'll give you the gist and say what we've actually found out, like about four or five, series of four or five experiments that have been replicated now, other labs have picked it up and doing it, that um, humans, uh, like uh, in across different languages and across ages, seem to like that representation. So that you're going for the number of yellows is bigger than the number of dots minus. So you're basically trying to avoid predicate negation, but you're using um, cardinality representation. Here's the flavor of how that um, work goes. I'll assume for this audience, everybody's heard about the approximate um, 
number system and that we, along with other animals, have this capacity to make guesstimates, for example, how many people there are in the room, how many chairs there are in the room, in a ratio-dependent uh, approximating way. Key fact, just the distinguishing eight from four, or 16 to eight, four from two, is gonna be easier than distinguishing, for example, 10 from eight. I think relatively, as the number of, say, dots in a scene rises, your acuity for estimating that coronality is gonna decrease in a ratio-dependent way that we can represent with um, uh, ever larger normal spreads. Uh, around the right answers, right? So there's the team that was involved um, in the experiments I'm about to tell you. And so like one kind of thing we would do, and again, some other labs have done this blissfully, Polish has a word that's just like uh, most, and uh, Barbara Tom Shepard's um, uh, decided she was gonna run all this. Everything I'm gonna tell you has been replicated um, uh, in Polish. Um, what we were interested in doing was seeing, so these first three trial types where you just got, got scattered all over the place, some dots where there's two outliers screaming at you, hey, I'm the outlier, you, yellow, who doesn't have a, a teammate, and then a different way of having yellows with teammates. That fourth one is a control condition I'll come to in a minute. We just wanted to see, like, how would people respond to this if you made them answer questions for easier, hard ratios for these various trial types, giving them about 200 milliseconds um, to answer, so not enough time to count. Um, turns out that's the only oddball, and surprisingly, subjects report, oh, thank God for the easy case <laughs> once in a while, I could just do a nice, um, simple gestalt line length um, kind of judgment. You move the dots off their centroids and things start getting harder. Again, it's exactly what you'd expect. Um, so that one at the top is the really crazy easy one. Um, the other three trial types, so basically whether the dots were completely mixed up or whether you were giving the subjects everything they needed to know to say there were some yellow outliers with no friends, Everything just landed on a, uh, a curve suggesting you were, they were using their approximating um, system right the way um, through. Uh, and uh, uh, some other labs had, had, had some nice models about what an approximating system would do with our stimuli. Um, and uh, so those were the R squares um, for how the data fit the model as if um, uh, right across the trial types. Um, uh, right across the trial types, um, uh, people were using their approximating system. Then just did some follow-up experiments to make sure that, forget 200 milliseconds, see if 150 milliseconds is enough to answer the question, were there outlier yellows? So, uh, uh, and the answer was, people's performance on that test was even better. So, uh, it's not like you couldn't answer the question in the, in the cases where you had um, uh, some yellow outliers with no friends. It's not as though you couldn't answer that question in 200 milliseconds. In fact, you could answer it even better and even faster. But if we posed it, it but you had to pose it as that kind of question, right? Are there yellows with no, uh, uh, with no friends? And we have various formulations of that. But you frame it as the most question, boom, the approximating system um, uh, kicks in. Uh, so tentative suggestion, it wasn't about one to one uh, plus. It was one of those number representation um, things. And so the next question we asked was, okay, look, what kind of number representation? Let's crank up the colors um, to be two, three, four, five um, color types. Uh, and now, like, try to pick um, uh, blue dots versus the uh, number of blue dots is bigger than the number of unblue dots versus the complicated one where you say it's the number of blue dots is bigger than the A. Get a subtract, take the total number of dots um, and subtract. And, um, in scenes with just two colors, so with just red dots and blue dots, then you can, after you get a little practice, you can identify the non-blues with the reds, uh, and your visual system in a two-color case will give you an estimate of the blues and an estimate of the reds, and uh, uh, you can then uh, estimate those for cardinality. But if that's how you understood the question, if you were understanding most as a question involving predicate negation, then as you cranked up three, four, or five colors, that strategy is gonna start getting harder and uh, worse um, for you. Whereas um, if you did the, um, here we go, if you did the uh, uh, subtraction uh, task, that predicts indifference to the number of colors. Because if you're just comparing the number of blue dots to the number of dots minus the number of blues, what do I care if the non-blues are green and yellow and purple? Um, I'm getting the answer by computation not by doing any comparison uh, across colors. But in that second case, now you've got to take an estimate of the dots, which means your acuity should be sensitive to like there being 15 dots, where if you were just comparing nine to six, then your acuity should be like an, a nine versus six acuity. 
So what was really nice is this made pretty clear predictions. If you're understanding most in terms of predicate negation, then you should be good on two color case, get worse for three, four, five, but when you're good, your acuity should be good. If, however, you're doing it by subtraction, your acuity should be generally less good because you're always taking in the total number of dots, but you shouldn't give a damn about the number of alternative colors, right? And of course, I would be cruel to tell you all of that if it wasn't just, um, and that's just to tell you, like, if you have to count, you know, if you have to worry about your representation of 15, your acuity is going to be like out there on that range. Um, and uh, uh, what you get is uh, better performance, uh, uh, ANS title performance, regardless of the number of contrast colors. And there's the R squareds assuming the poor acuity model. Um, so what we got was just, you know, this you know, very, really nice data suggesting, nope, you don't care about the number of alternative colors. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, your acuity is if you're always taking the total uh, cardinality into account. And it's worth remembering all the things that could have happened in our studies. So we really walked out. In fact, one of our graduate students, I think we spoiled. It was like his very first experiment was one that worked. Um, uh, but if you think about all the things that could have happened, you could have gotten good performance. The W is a, a, just indicating what's called the Weber fraction. W.15, that's, that, that's a good number. You could have had good performance across um, uh, subjects for two colors and increasingly bad performance report. You could have bad performance across the board. You could have bad performance at early trials and then decent performance for two colors once people cottoned on. You could have had worse acuity, 0.3 across the board. You could have had a mixed population of some steadfast negators and some steadfast subtractors, some switchers, some people who couldn't do the task, and yet time after time after time we do this, people just like from the first several trials are just zoning in on the subtraction um, uh, strategy. Uh, and so we thought, all right, um, uh, there's something about what people understand when they understand the quantificational word most, which has them saying, I'm the kind of animal who can estimate um, uh, cardinalities, uh, and I'm the kind of animal who would prefer not to deal with a predicate negation if I didn't have to. So, all right, I will encode the meaning of this fancy proportional quantifier in a way that fits my representational bill. I'll be the kind of creature, I'll do it in terms of, uh, I'll do it in terms of number representation, not one to one plus, even though I can do one to one plus, right? So it's not as though that capacity isn't there. In fact, in many circumstances, that'd be a faster way of getting the question answered. But evidently, um, humans just zone in on thinking, all right, I'm going to encode the meaning of the word most initially um, in this particular way. That is, it's a cardinality question that's framed in terms of subtraction and not negation. So the next question we asked ourselves was, OK, is this just an artifact of that particular kind of task? Or can you find across the board, across lots of tasks, a kind of um, a bias in data as a behavior suggesting that the most really does reflect a kind of ease or difficulty of representing the total um, cardinality. Because if we're right, you should be happy to use most when you can see, oh yeah, I can get an estimate of that total cardinality. Make it harder to get an estimate of the total cardinality. So you think, oh, uh, why did they say, say most? So now you can just like get off of psychophysics and do lots of easy uh, experiments. You just tap on the other ones you're running. There's a picture um, and just ask, which side is the better example of most of the dots are blue uh, or more of them are blue? Um, turns out, of course, it's exactly the same number of blues and yellows on both sides, uh, eight versus uh, uh, 12, uh, and uh, 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 like 58 to 13 amongst those exhibiting a stable preference. People say, oh, that's the better example uh, of uh, most there on the right, where you've um, gathered things um, together. Do it the other way around. Give people two pictures and say, um, uh, how would you want to uh, describe them? More of them are gray or most of them are gray. Put the things out that way. Give us how I'll describe that as a more uh, example of more. Um, now just put them all um, together and now uh, uh, people, oh, I want to describe that one as most. Because there's no difference in the dots. There. The dots are remaining totally um, the same. So again, what's going on in the environment is completely fixed. Um, if the meanings of more and most were extensional, then everything should be equally open. Uh, available to everybody to, to uh, describe them other ways, and yet there's a preference, and uh, again, a preference that's in the direction of saying, with most, you want things to be together. So then um, we thought, all right, let's 
push this one farther and see if you can get the same kind of asymmetry now, not with responding to stimuli, but with you yourself doing something to communicate the message. Um, and so instead of doing it linguistically, this was um, uh, back when people still found it fun to um, draw and play with iPads. Down at the Inner Harbor in Baltimore, you would just, um, uh, uh, on a nice day, just ask people, hey, you want to play with an iPad? Sure. <laughs> um, and, and it's going to be your job is to make her say, uh, pointing somebody across the way, that uh, more of the dots are blue, or it's your job to make them say most of the dots uh, uh, are blue. Right? There wasn't any really any confederate over there. All we just wanted to do was get people to do something on the screen. And what you could do, of course, is just push on the screen um, and make some uh, dots, either uh, yellow or blue, whatever they were. And of course, the iPad was keeping track of where everybody was, um, uh, was pushing. There's a pretty typical um, kind of picture for more uh, of the dots are blue. Um, there's a typical uh, one for most uh, of the dots are blue. Uh, and so now compute the centroid for uh, more. So like where, the, where when you're doing a more one, where have you clustered the yellows, where do you cluster the blues? If you're doing most, where did you cluster the yellows, cluster the blues? And really quite dramatically, it was um, uh, more. People wanted to like have things um, segregated out. Uh, most, they wanted them uh, brought together. Next question, is this an artifact of like 18 years of experience on the planet and getting a feel for um, what people like to do with more or most, or do you get this exact same pattern at the earliest stage at which you can test kids on this at all? And the answer is you get exactly the same pattern at the earliest stage at which you can test um, the kids on this. So for, for a, lots of kids, sorry, four, four and a half uh, before they're hitting uh, with most, and there's no big age difference uh, amongst that, um, that particular cohort, and we've um, done uh, replications of, uh, of that. Um, that sort of led us to think that even for a quantificational word like most, um, there's um, a, a kind of a representational specificity, that um, it's not as though you're just, okay, there's just an abstract relation between sets, it's the most relation, and you just name it as you like. There's something in here um, uh, uh, creating a preference for a uh, numeric kind of um, representation and one that involves subtraction um, as opposed to predicate uh, negation. Um, I'm not going to tell you today because the data is not 100% ready, but um, Tyler Knowlton, a grad student in linguistics at Maryland, um, he's um, uh, been pushing this and now we're looking, doing the same kind of stuff with universal quantifiers. And people have thought forever that each, every, and all must differ in meaning somehow, going back to a classic paper by uh, Wendler. And um, our pilot data, in fact, a little better than pilot data now, suggesting that each really has something like a first order, essentially distributive uh, representation. And all really is something like a comparison between um, uh, collections and every um, patterning with all. But if you can just introspectively feel like, yeah, yeah, there's some, some difference between each, every, and all, right? That's got to be uh, accounted for um, somehow. And uh, we're thinking that we're going to um, uh, be finding the same kind of uh, representational specificity with the um, uh, universal quantifiers. OK, last, uh, excellent, yeah, three minutes left, and I'll wrap up. So look, when I say the meaning of most is representationally specific, not saying that every single time you hear the word most, you must carry out the subtraction strategy. You're an intelligent creature. You very often use ancillary knowledge that takes however you've specified the meaning and then think, all right, the meaning tells me the question is, for example, is the number of uh, yellow dots bigger than the number of dots minus the yellow dots? But how do I get that question answered on a particular occasion? Well, I'll use whatever resources I've got. For example, if I can't see the dots, but Alan can, I might just ask Alan. Um, uh, and the meaning of most doesn't say, sorry, you can't ask Alan. You must, in fact, um, uh, compute it out. Right? And so uh, like going back to the chord analogy, uh, one thing I like uh, uh, about um, chord notation is that we know you can encode chords at various levels of specificity. So very just with chord names or on a staff with very specific notes, 
or in a fretboard um, state that's uh, instrument specific, right? So if you're a guitar player, that kind of graph will be familiar. It tells you not only that that's a G chord, it tells you like which frets to push down to make that particular G chord on that chunk of the guitar. Or you can even get more specific and have an encoding that would tell the guitar player which fingers to use on which states of the fretboard, right? So a fingering diagram, the one at the bottom, determines a fretboard state diagram, which will determine the specific notes, which will determine right, um, what chord it is. But you might think it'd be an open empirical question at what level of specificity um, meanings, are, um, uh, uh, meanings are specified as a break. So the most radical externalist, existentialist, counter-reformation theorist says, no, there is no specificity at all, right? That is, however you do it is totally up to you, but any other speaker of the language could just do it in a completely different way. Or you could imagine right down to very, uh, a very detailed specification. But one thing it's like important to remember is that um, I'm just trying to like, um, uh, make a case that the meanings are representationally specific, that there's something like a score in there that is um, specifying how this, if you like, truth condition or extension is specified. Exactly how that controls performance, super interesting and super hard question. But here's what you know if you're a musician. You can have a very highly specific score, something that's actually telling you where to put your fingers. That doesn't make you automated by it. Um, once you start getting some ancillary knowledge about how your instrument works, once you get some ancillary knowledge about how other minds work and how you're going to um, talk to them, you could have a super specific encoding and then on the fly use it in all sorts of different ways. So when we say the meaning of most is that subtraction algorithm, that is not to say we think that is the algorithm you're using every single time to get the question answered. It's rather we're saying that's the question you're trying to answer. And so if my score looks like that, that's the score I've got. So I'm sort of thinking about this as, like, there's a musician playing, and our job as cognitive scientists is to figure out what the score is. And we can't see it. Um, but the fact that we can't see the score doesn't make us think, well, look, all there are are the notes uh, in the air. If the, uh, the, the musician is using whatever score they've got, and of course you can fill out uh, under specified um, scores once you become a competent musician as well. So let's as always distinguish the competence um, from the performance. Actually, I think I have in this hour really, really underestimated the difficulties for the extensionless um, uh, counter reformation. There's a book I just produced, uh, came out over the summer, that like says actually it's much, much worse um, than uh, uh, what I've been saying um, thus far, and particularly worse once you start worrying about words like truth and true and event descriptions like, um, uh, sorry, an alga is placed over there. Um, Alvin chased Theodore around the tree happily, while Theodore chased Alvin around the tree unhappily. If you imagine two chipmunks chasing each other around the same tree, um, Alvin is delighted by this because he's chasing somebody with a vague sense of being chased, and Theodore is, is really unhappy about this because he's trying to get Alvin to come back to lunch, uh, but there's also some damn squirrel chasing him. Um, from an external world point, from the God's eye point of view, just looking down, what's going on is there's just two chipmunks chasing each other. That's the event that's really taking place in the world. You start looking inside those event descriptions, and I think the uh, extensionist picture just gets, starts uh, 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 getting uh, uh, even less um, uh, plausible. Uh, if you start thinking about the phenomenon of polysemy, which I think of as, uh, look, um, you, you can do various things with words. You can say Francis hexagonal and Francis a republic. Um, what's the external thing you're talking about when you talk about um, France? When we opened the window yesterday, it broke. Um, Chomsky has been offering examples like this for a very long time. So there's a, a book about um, lots of details underlying that and saying that, in fact, things get worse when you start looking um, into the details. But just back to the 67 picture, if we're thinking about a grammar um, as a specification of uh, sound meaning pairings for a particular language. And if we have excellent reason for thinking that the grammar is imposing constituency structure that isn't out there, and we have excellent reason for thinking the pronunciations are something like 
um, these internal scores, which speakers then use to create, if they're speaking a spoken language, um, uh, waveforms in the environment outside them. Then you might start thinking what the grammar is generating or danceable instructions for how to build mental representations of a certain kind. And if all the way down to the quantifier meanings, a word like most is saying, here's the instruction. Um, uh, go build a concept that has a certain kind of um, uh, subtractive uh, numerical um, character to it, then um, uh, maybe that's where we should look. Now, on my reading of history, that's where the field was ready to go in 1968. Um, and uh, what I'd like to suggest is the field is ready to go there, um, and uh, uh, we should go even though it's not uh, 1968 anymore. Thanks. to the case you talked very briefly about, about each, every, and all the. Um, I have the impression that there are lots of languages that have all that don't have the others, yeah. um, but, um, but maybe not the other way around. Yeah, so that's certainly true overtly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Chris Luterza, a um, student at Maryland a few years back, building on um, some work by Barry Shine, um, argued that uh, in languages he was looking at, and these were maybe Slavic languages, um, where you didn't have an overt uh, each. Uh, so actually, when you, if you were doing, you looked at construct constructions involving all, and any kind of universal um, uh, claim where you're getting a distributed reading, that you that it needed a covert um, distributor up there. That's in one sense not so surprising to a semanticist, since if you actually try to crank out the truth condition, or even just so simply something as uh, simple as every dog barked, the standard theory says take your set of dogs, take your set of barkers, and now apply every. But to apply universal, what you have to do is distribute over the things in the set. Right, since you, that's uh, very different from saying the dogs gathered uh, in the park. So um, following, let's say, what hurts a shine, that line of thought, I'd be inclined to think everybody's got each somewhere. But because it's available as a covert distributor, um, many languages themselves say themselves the bother of having uh, an overt item that does the, uh, the trick. Every, my understanding, is pretty rare. Um, and uh, that's an interesting thing. One would like to know, one would like to know what's the, what is the difference between every and all that makes um, uh, apparently all so sort of common uh, and every less common. Well, and then the other you know, thing that, from a more syntactic point of view, is the uh, singular versus plural Correct. part of it. Correct. And so when you apply the distributive, that doesn't make that's right. it singular. Yeah, that's right. So if, if the data we are getting is on the right track, suggesting that every patterns with all in being um, sensitive to collections. That's in some sense going to be the most interesting thing because in many respects, every, since every is singular like each, and it, um, uh, on the other, although unlike each, it's much more friendly to generic uh, interpretations, not as friendly as all, but more friendly than each. Um, uh, but, the, but if in fact, every distributes and it's morphologically singular, yet it patterns with all, um, uh, with regard to, in some sense, having as part of its semantics. No, you really want all the dogs together and each not. That would be the most interesting. And just to give you a flavor of how we're, how we're doing this, um, if you flash a bunch of things uh, on a screen and then ask people afterwards, like, okay, so how many dogs were there? How many red things? Right, you get a certain baseline of how good they are of that. Most, which is proportional quantifier, so you know it in some sense has to be um, uh, uh, getting people to identify. So for most of the dots are yellow, you have, to look at, you have to set the dots and the yellow things. You can show that if you just prompt people with most of the dots are yellow as opposed to each dot is yellow, and now after the fact, ask them how many dots or how many yellow things are. They're insanely better if you prime them with most as you prime them with each. 
Um, and if you prime them with just a, or the, or some, they're like off their place. Like, well, what, I'm supposed to pay attention to how many of these things there were? Um, and uh, so then we just want to know, okay, so now which way does, does every fall? And every is very clearly falling uh, with all. So uh, give people, um, every dog is green after the fact, how many dogs were there, they're great. Give them each dog is green, like, how am I supposed to know? Um, so there's something that every and all have in common. It's something like priming you to look for the sets, as we would um, put it. But that is interesting that that comes apart from the morphology. Holy grail hope. Vendler's diagnostics about what distinguishes each, all, and every. If only you could figure out what the representational format of the meaning is, that plus whatever the quirks of morphology were would deliver you um, Vendler's taxonomy. But that's a holy grail. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering whether it's important to your view that um, the conceptual, what, what I would say, blend of thought, that itself can be described in non-referential terms, like in non-externalist terms, or whether what you're saying is in principle compatible with the thought. Uh, look, the, you, there's no like proprietary vocabulary for talking about the language of thought, which isn't in terms of properties. So I am totally happy to be an externalist about lots and lots of mental contents. Right? You know, the study of vision already you know, pushes one in that direction. And I'm so I'm totally happy to say that you have a concept of dog that its content is given partly in terms of the dogs. Um, because I think polysemy is such a robust phenomenon, I'm going to want to drop the idea that it's one word, one concept. But very often, when you use a word to access a concept, that concept will have some kind of external content. Of course, that concept, if it's a Jerry Fodor mental representation, something like this, it's also going to have its own syntax. Um, so it's not like I think there is no place for external content. But what I do think is that that place is not in the theory of meaning. So it's super tempting to say, Meaning of a sentence, content of the thought expressed by the sentence. Aren't they going to be more or less the same kind of thing? And you know, part of me just wants to say, no, in fact, they're just not going to be the same kind of thing at all. The meaning of the sentence is some intrinsic property of the sentence that is impaired with the pronunciation via some grammar that's imposing constituency structure. The content of the thought seems to me at the moment an insufficiently articulated technical notion. So for various enterprises in the cognitive science, we might want various notions of contents of mental representation, some of which involve notions of constituency or syntax peculiar to the particular branch of the mind they're worrying about. Um, right. For example. For example. Um, there might be places where what you want to say is, yes, but when rational beings are starting to engage with one another, don't we sometimes want to let go of that and just turn ourselves over to the mind-independent possibilities? And sure, and in fact, a lot of idealized psychology takes that form. So I'm totally happy with the idea that the 36 dice possibilities, that that has a certain role in thinking, let's just call it the idealized content of an assertion you might make with a sentence whose meaning is not that content at all, whose meaning is much more richly structured and grammaticized. Right? And so um, if, if when people say meaning, what they really mean is something like the content of the thought you're expressing in a particular context, and they've got a technical notion of content in mind, that's, of course, fine. And I'm happy to say that some of that is external. Though, I would say, even in the parade cases there, like, for example, Putnam's favorite example, water, I think you actually look at how the word water gets used. And in fact, it's a argument against Putnam um, and externalism. Uh, people just don't use, word, don't use the word water in accordance with the rules that Harvard philosophy department laid down. Um, uh, and that's just, I think, not that surprising. Yeah. So I mean, so as a, as 
Yeah, so that's maybe the only one here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I find the picture basically congenial. So, you know, I don't know if like uh, I'm like my model theoretic bona fides are sort of less deeply felt than everybody else. I'm not sure, but like I want to understand the argument a little yep. bit better. So, like, um, so it seemed to me that a lot of the arguments that you gave, um, the upshot of them is that. Really, what we've been doing as semanticists is cutting the pie too coarsely. Yep. So really, you know, a lot of the arguments, sort of what they, they point to, is like some form of hyper intentionality. That's way. So that's one way to sort of construe it. Yeah. And um, though I, I, I just I would just say, not because the talk, just talk of hyper intentionality makes it feel like there's a regular garden variety of intentionality, yeah. and then we've gone beyond that. Yeah. I just would prefer to describe it as intentionality. And then there's the coarsening of intentionality. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 yeah. I, I prefer that way to yeah. speak about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that sort of, you know, hyper, or sort of, you know, hyper fine grain from the point of view of sort of, you know, normal semantic theory and stuff, you can still theorize about that in sort of denotational model theoretic terms. Sure. Yeah. And so I guess I'm just wondering. What if somebody you know, responds to this argument by saying, oh, I see, you know, here's what you've showed me. Not that meanings um, are in the head, but really that meanings are out there. There's just a lot more of them than I had sort of figured to be in with something like yeah. I'm just wondering, I'm just curious. Well, look, if, if, somebody, if somebody replies to this by saying, despite everything we say in the first chapter of our semantics courses, and despite everything we teach our students, the upshot is really meanings are in the head after all, and they exhibit a kind of syntax that um, is different than the syntax you, the theorist, will use to describe the mind-independent possibilities. And I was like, well, right then, then I had no argument against such a person. Except that I'd like, well, that, that's what we believe. Well, why do we tell telling the students the opposite? It's, if that's what we really believe, then you might think, for like both moral and intellectual reasons, it would be good to stop saying things we don't believe, or that is, we stop saying, we stop saying things I don't believe, um, right? And so, it, it like part of me wants. That's why I said I, I, I know, like people who are far more committed in print than you are, they're just too smart to really believe these things, and yet, and yet, and 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 there's a kind of intransigence that comes with. Like, no, this is the way semantics must be done. And I, 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 for a while, thought, oh, it's just façon de parler. People will let go of it. But that's what I thought when I was in my 20s. And I'm now in my 50s, and uh, I don't have that much longer left. Um, <laughs> and so uh, uh, I at least am going to say, I don't believe this, and I will not say it. And then other people can say, I believe it. I believe you, Paul, but I'm going to say the other thing anyway. And then people can figure out <laughs> what the weird sociology of that is. Like other <laughs> other enterprises of inquiry don't work this way. Yeah. Um, I can think of maybe a couple of reasons. So one is that the alternative is maybe. So you know, I know Tim Hunter has been working on, um, you know, sort of recasting some of the you know, semantic theorizing. Of, you know, for example, words like most yeah. to you know, do just, justice to those sort of results that you found. But I think, like for a long time, that sort of alternative was just like not a live option. That's one possibility; it just hadn't been developed. Yeah. The other is sort of you know like like representational or internalist um, approaches to semantics. Like that's in a way that's there in Montague. Um, so Montague, you know, eventually ends up in model theoretic land. But before he gets to model theoretic land, he's in like you know intentional logic. Land. An intentional logic line you can think of as precisely the sort of system, you know, it might not be, there might be all sorts of reasons. Well, but, but, I mean, that, yeah. that it, of course a model theoretic person is going to have their syntax. Yeah. But when you ask them, what's the relation between that and the grammar of the child of ours? Yeah. Montague's answer was, emanations from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology have no bearing on the question. Yeah. Now, that sounds like somebody who says sure. that the, the, the constituency structure that the child's grammar imposes has no bearing on the question they're trying to ask. And so for Montague and Davidson and Lewis all, 
they they were asserting that there's some property the sentence has, its meaning, that can be characterized in their model theoretic terms, and that in fact the constituency struck that Chomsky was on was misleading. Right? And so that and that's that look, of course you explore that hypothesis. But part of the reason I'm finding like lately I'm putting this in more historical cast is that in you know 1963-64 there was Katz and Fodor. It's not like in the 60s it was unheard of to think about trying to specify a theory of meaning that would take the form of saying, look, something like that syntax that's been imposed by a rewrite system grammar, and now our job is to go from there in some other stage to something like a sentence in the language of Fodor and Margarita's grammar. And each in their own way, Davidson and Montague and Lewis all said, that is not semantics. It is not semantics until you specify the property of the sentence in terms of the mind independent of it. And that's the thing I just want to like see. What was the argument for that? Right. For Lewis and Montague, it just seems to be a brute stipulation. Right? This is what I shall mean by semantics. And of course, if that's what you're going to mean by it, that's fine. But there, I think there really was in the 1960s this idea that there was a property of the sentence, its meaning, and you could actually try to go about studying it by thinking it had a certain kind of constituency structure and that its atoms were representational. And then that idea got lost. So just in response to your question, I don't think it's like the idea never existed. I think it was right there in 1968. And a trio of philosophers said, that's not the way it should go. I just think the world would be a better place if linguists stop listening to the philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make a kind of a comment by way of analogy. So, I mean, you know, vaguely similar issues arise in, in vision. And, um, Not vaguely. Yeah. Well, yeah. no, I mean, yeah. the exact mapping between the terminology that you use and the terminology yeah. that vision people use is, is very, you know, dubious. So I, I don't want to make the, I don't want to make too close an analogy. But that being said, there is a very similar situation in sociology and history of vision where um, kind of standard in art in textbooks in vision even these days is, is something like, um, you know, there's this objective world that has certain properties, and the perceptual system usually gets them vertically, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, uh, then occasionally doesn't, like in the cases of visual illusions. But whereas um, vision people are kind of all know the things that make it make one realize that that view of the situation is impossible. And, and then, you know, in fact, it's kind of meaningless to say that the world has properties. I mean, we all know about color being intentional and stuff like that. But, so you would think that people, like you said, it's a test on the parlay, that people don't really mean that when they just write it in textbooks. And yet, one finds that most of the field of vision kind of does mean that, even though it contradicts central findings in 20th century vision. And I'm, I'm not really sure why people don't get off of no, that. I, 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 I agree with you. Brian gave a fantastic talk about color in the philosophy department. He's going to my colleague Frankie Egan works on exactly this. Though, at least with vision, I can feel the initial pull of saying what I'm seeing <laughs> is out there. Feels real. <laughs> I can I can at least understand where that motivation comes from. Whereas in the case of language, I have thought that like the one thing you learn in the fifties through the sixties is wherever constituency structure is, it's not that you're hearing it in the word strings, right? And so it's but I agree, I agree that the parallel the parallel is there. I just find it even more surprising in my home case, because I thought in my home case the starting lesson was that um, constituency structure is color on stilts. Um, there's, there's no property of the string. That, in fact, that's just the point of, of Chomsky's animating examples. I'll specify the strings for you in um, equivalent ways as far as the string is concerned, but the one way it poses constituency structure the other doesn't. And they say, okay, maybe that's just the syntax. Maybe the pronunciation and the meaning is really world directed. And then the more you study, Pronunciations, right? Uh, right, like Karen, right over there, right? No, but actually, it's really complicated. Um, of course, that which is out there is mattering. But that's not where that, that's not where the theoretical action uh, is. And so, I would at least then thought that you know, uh, uh, Davidson, Lewis, and Montague would say, "I'm about to say something that seems completely wild from what we know." Uh, and now I'm going to give you reasons for adopting this really wild perspective on meaning, which a linguist should be saying is like, oh, you got to be kidding. 
But the fact that they just said is this is totally hopeless. And that's the thing, I, like, I think it, like at some point the field just has to say, take the first step of seeing this is not totally obvious. In fact, if you can just open yourself to thinking that it's not totally obvious, you realize, oh, in fact, if anything, there seems to be a, a big front face case the other way, so the counter-reformation should actually be fronting us up with arguments to push us, uh, not telling us that they're in charge of the show, which sociologically, sociologically, I think that's really what's going on. Uh, so a group of philosophers said we were in charge of a certain show, and uh, uh, my colleagues in linguistics went along, and they shouldn't have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm 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 pleased to hear that a, a, a young a young chap such as yourself um, <laughs> is still interested in uh, Chomsky and Hallam. Um, oddly enough, um, that was my introduction to cognitive science when I was like 19, just by sheer accident. I, I just um, I'd say it was mine yeah. too well, because I was an undergraduate here in the eighties. And you could not get anything related to cognitive science here in the 80s, right? And so I arrived at MIT and just like got Chomsky and Halleck. I was like, whoa, you people in New Jersey should hear the news. Uh, uh, all right, well, I mean, this, this was um, long before that. It was Edinburgh, so I mean, it was, um, 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 I guess some people there were interested in this. But it's certainly in an unusual way for a psychologist to, to think. I think part the, there's a larger background to the kind of resistance you're talking about um, um, is the notion of a blank slate. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if there aren't all these things in the head, um, then they have to be in the outside world. It's really all in the outside world, and what has to be in the head to begin with is precisely nothing. And, of course, everybody knows that's not true, but still, uh, they kind of believe it. Yeah. And, and they keep on believing it, despite the fact that they know it's not true. Um, um, I've heard biologists lecture developmentalists to say that, of course, biologists know that that which is innate is observable at birth, and only that which is observable at birth. And of course, hell no, yeah. but teeth and hair and things as well as I do. Um, um, so there's again a much larger, large <coughs> I agree. So, so I'm working on a, a book that is partly going to be a kind of history of the '60s on this. And so, the for semanticists, Lewis, Montague, and Davidson are the um, the trini relevant trinity that gets things going. But um, uh, Lewis is a student of Quine's, mm -hmm. and um, I think like that a pretty easy way to read David Lewis is it's just Quine with a lot more stuff out there. And Montague and Lewis were doing a kind of tag team, and Barbara Parti became part. Of it. And so I actually think, as a matter of how the history unfolded, you're just spot on right that the um, the uh, 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 specter of Quine and a certain kind of Harvard empiricism is um, is just right there. Now, what's interesting is when Chomsky was at the Harvard Society of Fellows, he's hanging out with Nelson Goodman, who's doing the structure of appearances, and, this is maybe catch the model theory point, thinking, oh, you mean like if you got your syntax of how you wanted to talk about a certain chunk of the world right, you might say that was coming from what? And, you know, Chomsky thought, oh, great, I'm just going to take Goodman and I'll go, go do what we now call cognitive science with it. And in fact, between them, that was just a huge break. Because Goodman thought, no, 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 it can't be coming from here. It's just either out there or made up. Um, and so it's just a, a, everything Chomsky said just had to be described as a total fiction. Um, and so I, I think like like sorting out how much of that blank slate empiricism has just at one room come filtering into semantics um, is is going to be a story worth trying to work out. That, that reminds me of a, 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 um, a traumatic event in, in, in my early history. So my first day in Oxford as a PhD student, joining Bruner's group, and the first thing Bruner said to me was, oh, come on out, I, I want you to meet Nelson Goodman. And he sort of pushed me into this room, 
in which was sitting all by himself, Nelson Good Goodman, who said to me, um, well, well, tell me, what is it you have in your mind? And all I had in my mind was Chomsky and how and Foda and things like that. So that didn't go well. <laughs> kind of simple tests to the semantic representation. It's rather, we have a hypothesis about how, about what the pronunciation was paired with. Mm -hmm. So we think the pronunciation of most is paired with a representation that's got something about the uh, numerosity of the total cardinality. And so what we asked is, could we quickly and easily find further symptoms of that? So it was more that we, we predicted that um, people should actually have a preference for keeping things together if they're thinking mostly, whereas segregating if they're thinking morely. And so we just wanted to find out if that was true. I mean, by itself, those te inferring from those tests back to a semantic representation, they like it, like, oh, come on, that's just like a particular fact about usage. How are you gonna get all the way back to it? But it was more, it was more that we had a concrete hypothesis about um, what the representational format was, and so we just wanted to ask, okay, um, will it have the, does it have the symptoms that we uh, predict? So in fact, what we're now trying to do is refine this um, to actually using some independent models about where the visual system can and can't comfortably gather. So one of the things that's known is drawing the line around, that helps a lot. But now if you get the lines out, at what point do things become too far away from the centroid so the visual system just falls apart and just no longer sees the brain. So what we want to try to do is independently identify that spot, that sweet spot, and now see if in fact, by just um, manipulating the stimulus just to the left or the right of that line, you can drive people's um, judgments about whether they want to describe it, um, seeing it more or most, even if, in fact, um, if you just looked at the stimuli, it would just look like a completely continuous um, range of stimuli. Now, if we get that to work, then uh, uh, that that be you know then uh, experiment, which you might say, okay, that's further evidence for the underlying representational uh, format. So I, I I wouldn't want to I don't a bunch of behavioral data. I wouldn't want to go there. I feel I feel much more confident if we can say you know uh, kind of almost kind of diversity style. We'll take we're going to hold the external world fixed and drive your judgment by just doing something um, to your inner representation. Because that's, of course, exactly what the counter-reformation says. Well, there's no reason to suppose that um, at all. Yes, so th that, that's really, that helps me clarify what the purpose of the talk was, so thank you. Um, I guess uh, the reason that I had the question what was sort of driving it underlying like this, if you're, um, I guess, in some way trying to defend the counter-reformation, it seems like one of the things we go to when data might be like that really what you're hooking on to you and your colleagues are hooking on to something about the felicity conditions of more or less right um, okay. and so then the question would be like well look maybe like what's sort of easiest or what sort of just goes by way of common conversation um, by felicity is sort of using um, the particular sort of strategies you've identified um, and sort of tending to use um, more when things are discrete as opposed to but like that doesn't necessarily tell me that's right. So the, but that's that's probably the only way one to do the iPad study, where um, felicity conditions for the utterance can take you completely off the table. We're just saying your comments speaker in English. I ask you to make somebody else say that most of the dots are blue. If you just have in your mind, oh, there are like any number of thoughts I could equally well have with the word most. Uh, only one thought. Subtraction thought, negation thought, um, then you wouldn't predict um, that kind of patterning with the uh, look, we should put dots on the page, and now 
I'm gonna I'm I'm giving you a picture of what I think most of the dots to be. And you certainly then wouldn't predict that kids at the earliest ages you can test um, uh, manifest the same uh, the same disposition. So uh, I wonder where they saw sorry. So so this is a oddball comment. So you're using this metaphor of space in some ways for many and most. But we can use many and most to refer to things that don't happen temporarily, you know, aren't present yep. all at the same time. Yep. So, you know, you know, many sounds or most of the sounds. Yeah. So how exactly does that work? So if the question is, how do you get the question answered given what the question is? Right. That seems to me just like that's going to be a question for that particular branch of psychology. Right. What we would say, so what we would say, is the question you're trying to answer is right. is the intersection bigger than the cardinality right. minus. So there's, there might be a different system of grouping, or you know, the equivalent that's of right. drawing. The that's circle. right. That's right. And so, so it can be modality. Oh, I, it, yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. Right. And, and 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 again, not just because you're drawing an ancillary knowledge, it might be that. For a particular modality, the way you have of getting it. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's clear. So, this is super important, so it's not an awful question at all. We are not in any way saying that the particular experiment we did at 200 milliseconds flashing dots right. has any kind of privilege right. at all. Right. The only reason we did that was because 200 milliseconds is too fast to count. Right. And, God bless them, the vision scientists have independent models right. of what goes on. For those stimuli at that window, that's the only reason we right. chose those so particular many, stimuli. So, so drawing on that, does many and most? It's sort of almost an interface. So, yeah. the meaning of those things will be could be somewhat different depending on whether it's interfacing with the visual stimuli, yeah, the that's right. stimuli so, or I don't know, tactile. Yeah, that's or right. Something and and like so that. here's here's how fine grain that actually gets. So now just hang on to most mm -hmm. and consider it with a mass noun. Yeah, that's instead exactly. of yeah. accounting. Yeah. So um, uh, it was known independently that other primates could do approximate area estimation. Right. Um, and that what had been shown for kids and human adults, but unsurprisingly, we did, okay, we have it too. Um, so now you can take, uh, a, instead of dots, blobs. So it's blobs, and it's like 60% red, 40% um, right. blue. And it turns out that people's uh, acuity for those is slightly better than their acuity for the corresponding um, scenes with dots. And then you can do the kind of diversity kind of thing. You take a stimulus that can be described either as most of the splotches of paint or most of the paint. And, right. and you find out independently people are happy to describe them either way. Mm -hmm. And then use the count noun morphology and you get one vapor curve. Right. You use the mass noun morphology, you get a slightly different one. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's slightly better. So it's as if it's as if there's something underlyingly neutral about these words um, that lets them play with mass. Right. But and it's not you're imposing a grid on the mass now and stuff. It's more complicated, right? But now your most money contrast that's super interesting too because you, I think I could easily imagine a mind that treats most and many fundamentally differently because it, it does most by the one to one plus strategy. And it does many by a cardinality estimation um, strategy. If we're right, that's just not the kind of mind we've got. Right. If we're right, our words, right. our quantificational words are called quantificational um, aptly. Right. There really is an interface with an ancient system of uh, quantity estimation. But, but the, that's right. See, now, but now we're thinking interfaces. Right. The moment you think interfaces, you're like, right, well, now I got to need to know what's the format on this side and right. what's the format on this side, and if that's what meanings are, the things that interface, then they have to have a particular format. And right. all the formal model theory in the world won't tell me what that format is. I just got to do cognitive science to find out what that format is. So my question is kind of for those of us who've been raised in like tunnel affirmation semantic theory. Yeah. Can we um, maybe like take the formalism as psychological hypotheses and try to test them in that way, yeah. or so do we? Have to give it all up. Look, I think it will not certainly not give it all up. Um, that's 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 out, right? That is, at minimum, what you've got 
is what you might think of very loosely as a more level one kind of description of what the problem space is. Um, though you might not have very much at all about the actual um, nitty gritty of the representation format. But that's a much more delicate question. So I've got this book that says counter reformation semantics also came with the idea that there's a lot of polyodicity, that there's a lot of functional items down there, and that fundamentally the modes of semantic composition have to do with something like functional application. I independently think that's a mistake, but that's a much more delicate kind of question about how you think the details of combinatorial semantics are going to go. In principle, we know what it's like to have a mind that would treat the um, meanings of scores, but in exactly the idiom of the standard semantics expert. You just take Frege's precursor inside the head and say, that's what you're doing. So one, one way to read counter-reformation semantics is as making explicit a hypothesis that Frege blew it. He thought he had to invent it. Nope. That system is there, and that is, in fact, how the child acquires a, 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 a language. And then he said, OK, so there's a hypothesis one. And then what you want is, OK, give me another hypothesis that um, uh, uh, reconstructs standard for semantics class in a different form of idiom. Right? I think I've got one of those. But that's now, that's now a debate where like, you, know, you need semanticists in a room arguing about specific constructions. Is it, as I think, massively conjunctive as opposed to massively function applications? But that's, but that's orthogonal to the question about whether the meanings are back there or in here. Thank you, Paul. Graduate students, if you're going to do a poster for the perceptual science forum, we're going to need your titles. And you should do them. Also, there's coffee and um, treats back guy. Something like significant. Yeah, but there's just no, 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 no